Hi, and welcome to Diversity Plus. Diversity Plus is the Indie Plus arm exploring the issues that minority gamers face by showcasing upcoming designers, discussing subjects in depth, and having a lot of fun playing games. Today we'll be discussing some of the issues that gamers with disabilities may face when going to conventions. Please note that this event upholds the Indie Plus community standards. To find out more about the standards, you can head to our website at IndiePlus.org. Now, I am Sarah. I'm your moderator today. I do illustration, layout, and game design for the tabletop RPG industry. Uh, I have a co-moderator, and that is Ariana. Ariana, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Ariana Ramos. I get hired to write things sometimes, but mostly I play games. And so I like to entertain the idea that we should have diversified games. <laughs> That's it. Awesome. And then tonight we have a couple of guests. Uh, first of all, uh, Beth, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Beth Rimmels. I'm a writer, editor, social media marketing manager, and now game designer. And I've been playing board games, card games, pretty much literally my entire life. And uh, playing and GMing role-playing games for several decades. So, yeah, I've been at this a while. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, and then we also have uh, Elsa with us. Uh, Elsa, if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Elsa Shemison Henry. I'm a writer, game designer. Uh, I kind of fell sideways into working in games as a historian, and um, I'm also a disability access coordinator for a number of conventions. Excellent. Um, so like I said, our, the subject of our panel today is gamers with disabilities and conventions specifically. Uh, so we previously had a panel where it was just basic 101 issues. Um, and the, it definitely came, a lot, uh, came up a lot with comments and some of the, the actual panel itself, uh, the idea that going to conventions is another hurdle at times. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And to, to start us off, I was hoping, Beth, that uh, you could tell us a little bit about the first time you went to a convention. Strangely enough, because I was raised to be a geek, but I came to conventions kind of late. Um, and when I did, it was without any sort of disability issues. Um, so my experience is a little different than other people's. Hopefully mine is just a temporary disability. Um, but my first conventions were here on Long Island. Um, and pretty much the standard fan experience. Huge crowds, trying to see everything at once, trying to do everything at once. It becomes a very different experience once you're going there navigating vision issues um, because crowds become much more difficult to navigate and uh, convention setup can be very different. So, like I said, m my experience is a little interesting because I've had both sides of it. Um, so that's good. Um, I, I, we can probably pick up some of those those issues a little bit later. Uh, like you mentioned in the signage, I'm really interested in that. Um, mm -hmm. But Elsa, did you want to tell us a little bit about uh, your convention experience? Sure. So the first convention that I went to was actually. Oh no, you have you cut out just a little bit. Uh, the first convention that I went to was one of the first PAX Prime. Conventions. Um, I'm from Seattle, Washington, and uh, I used to work at a gaming store. So I worked the store booth at Emerald City Comic Con and PAX. And I remember I didn't want to go out onto the con floor or go adventure. <coughs> I was kind of alone and doing it by myself. And uh, with low vision, the crowds, even when it was in the early days of PAX, were still crazy. Um, and it's since gotten even worse. And I. Uh, I sort of have hesitated going to larger cons because of my vision without another human being with me. So, since you, you both mentioned crowds, um, what is it about crowds specifically? Is it, um, is it how other people react to you or is it navigating within a big mass of people? The combination. Oh, you want to go first? <laughs> uh, sure, sorry. Um, I mean, for me, it's a combination of both because on the one hand, I see what a normal person sees, I see, like, through a toilet paper tube. 
So my field of vision is probably about that. And uh, I have a white cane, but at a con floor, everyone is looking at people's costumes, they're looking at their phones, they're looking at their handbooks to see where they're going next. People aren't paying attention, and so if you're carrying a white cane or if you're using a wheelchair, you're not necessarily what you're looking for. So you both have to navigate other people. I'm not expecting you to be there, and therefore not seeing you. Or you have to navigate you not being able to see everybody else. So it is it's, it's all mixed up into the same issue. OK, that's, that's helpful. Uh, Beth, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, basically just echoing the same thing because yeah when you're dealing with vision issues you don't realize that people are coming up on you or are right next to you as you turn so the bumping into people is an issue them bumping into you because they think you can see them um, can definitely be an issue and like I said for me it's dealing with low vision at the moment but I've spoken to other people where again navigating crowds like say if it's a hearing disability because again they're not hearing someone coming up on them um, and a lot of times people don't realize you're having a problem if they don't notice that you like for example I may or may not be wearing an eye patch but that doesn't mean that I can see it any better but people just assume you're fine or they assume the eye patch is a fake so yeah I mean that it's part of a costume I want to address yes. that really quickly um, because I so, was sort of so, so the really, even if eye patch is part of a costume, it's still covering up your eyesight. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that, and also, if you're wearing it as a costume piece, you should be aware of the fact that you don't, you're not used to not seeing. The people who are wearing eye patches as costumes, I actually see them as a mild safety hazard because they're not used to not seeing things. <laughs> um, so, like, if they're, their perception, if, like you're saying, is they're going to be they're not going to be able to perceive everything in front of them like they would if they had their full sight. Right. <laughs> um, my question would be, if crowds are a problem, has there ever been cons that you've reconsidered not going to once you realize that they're fairly small and are starting to grow? Because I know that I've started to go to Origins last year and everybody was complaining on how crowded it was despite the fact that it's not say, a Gen Con where a massive amount of people, but once you know that it's starting to get more people coming in, do you ever think to yourself, well, I'm not going to go to that one if I don't have someone come up with me, or I'm just going to avoid the first floor entirely because there's going to be too many people? Yeah, I used to attend San Diego Comic Con every year because I was covering comic book journalism and I was actually an Eisner judge one year so San Diego Comic-Con used to be part of my regular routine now this was right before it exploded size-wise but at that point it was still pretty darn big and right now with what I'm dealing with first of all just playing flying across country would be a little awkward by myself because again maybe not be able to see signs as well and things like that but the crowd, yeah, that would definitely be intimidating at this point because you're talking hundreds of thousands of people there. For me, I would say it's not so much that it's a con that got bigger as that for me, it's I went to New York City Comic Con a couple years ago with a friend and afterwards I was like, I'm not doing that again unless if I'm going there for work. Like at this point, I'm just not doing cons that get that huge unless if it's for my job. And therefore, I have sort of a certain level of, this is what I need to participate in your event. Okay, so it's basically you're indicating that cons are, in some sense, aren't accommodating to people who may have a certain disabilities because it's sort of like they're only doing it if you're working towards them, which is really sad from what you're indicating to me because... What if we have younger generation coming in, hey, I want to go hang out with my friends, and then are just going to be like, this is the worst experience, why am I in this hobby? <laughs> How could we communicate with them to just be like, this is not the way you should approach this? Or what tips would you give someone who is like younger than you starting to come into cons? I would say if con you want to go to, if you're younger and you have a disability is that you research the con ahead of time 
find out if they have accessibility standards, find out what those accessibility standards are. If they don't have them, tell them they need those things to get to their event. Uh, one place that I want to call out as being really great about that is NorwestCon, which is in mm -hmm. Seattle. And they have accessibility standards that, I mean, it's amazing. It's all up on their website. They have a handout that they hand out to people when they're on site. They're doing what everybody of a certain size of convention should be doing. They're addressing it head on. And I think that that's really important. Because they're, um, they're doing what I want Worldcon to do. They're doing what I want World Fantasy Con to do. They're actually saying, this matters, and so we're putting it front and center. And so I think if you want to go to any con and you have a disability, saying this is what I need from you is great. That's awesome. Sarah, yeah, you muted yourself. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I'm typing and taking notes while we're talking. Yeah, secretly um, you're trying to get me to mod the whole thing. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> only a little. Only a little. Uh, I was... I was going to say, we'll put a link up to NorwestCon's uh, standards so that everyone can see that and see uh, a good example of what to look for. Um, Beth, did you have any tips for uh, younger gamers that you wanted to share? Did you hear me, Beth? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that was directed to me. No, it was down to play <laughs> I'm so sorry. I do that all the time. Sorry. It's totally cool. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, tips for younger gamers? Um, was that the question? Because like, I only yeah. got the question. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Um, don't assume. Don't necessarily assume that... Like I said, things are props. Don't necessarily assume that everybody's functioning exactly as you are is the main thing. And, of course, be courteous. I, I like that. And I'm not going to bring up Daredevil again because I know how Elsa re will react. <laughs> her eyebrows went up a little bit. Just like the moment you said Daredevil, like her head tilted, eyebrows went up. You're like... <laughs> <laughs> well, there was that little incident a week and a half ago. So, <laughs> should I talk about that, Beth? Go ahead. So, uh, about a week and a half ago, I guess, I was told by some people who were at Emerald City Comic Con that they saw sighted people using White Kings and Daredevil and Matt Murdock cosplay. And I got kind of about that and posted about it. A lot of people really didn't like what I was saying, that sighted people couldn't use excessive, uh, adaptive devices as costume pieces. But I think it's really important for the safety of people with disabilities to reserve adaptive devices for the people who need them because we need to be, need to be identifiable as actually people in order to have people in common spaces recognize our disabilities. And right now, people aren't being recognized as disabled in con spaces at all. Like, you walk through Gen Con with a white cane and nobody notices. Um, so until I feel safe walking around the con and feel like my disability is acknowledged and recognized as something necessary to pay attention to, I don't want people who don't use my white cane. I, I lost the end of that. You don't want people to use your white cane... Unless if they need it, because if it's a cross-end case, it dilutes the symbol as you know, useful. Um, no, I think that's that's a fair point because I know there's also been uh, people who use wheelchairs who have have post made blog posts about you know you need to be aware of me on the convention floor because even though I may be at like a lower level. So you don't see me when you're just looking straight across the crowd. You need to be aware of me and be aware of your costumes and how they can invade my space if I am lower down. Oh, um, I actually have a very evocative point about that. Uh, at Gen Con, I have to use a wheelchair because of my chronic pain condition. And um, I have been smacked in the face by multiple toy weapons because people were doing demonstrations of their play weapons and weren't looking at where I was. Yeah, 
That's not my face. That's pretty <laughs> awful, actually. I know, I know they didn't mean to, but it doesn't matter. That's that. That's awful. I think it's yeah. also sort of just an acknowledgement of the space that you're taking up. It's not saying that you're not allowed to take up that space. It's just them being aware because, uh, and this is not even related, I got hit by a bat one day sitting on the floor because somebody didn't notice that they were like swinging <laughs> and didn't look down. They just looked like, <laughs> like they didn't, like, didn't tilt their head down. And uh, the other thing that needs to be pointed out is for the younger generation is realizing that, and for example, I work with the deaf and hard and hearing in my job, and a lot of times the younger generation doesn't realize that you're still allowed <laughs> to go into a place and be like, I need an interpreter. So I think it's also reminding them that they have rights to come in and just be like, this is what I need, and be as loud as possible. And we have to remind that with the younger crowds that are coming in, that even though you guys are also saying it the, with your stories, is for them to not be timid because fuck, they're gonna get shit if they're if they're just like sort of quietly going like, oh, excuse me, can you please not hit me with your toy sword? <laughs> just I want to actually acknowledge the deaf and hard of hearing thing too. A lot of cons don't have interpreters, and that's something we really need to step up on. I don't even know where to put that in my notes. Let me put that down. <laughs> That's a really good point. Um, if someone were to come up to me as, as an organizer and tell me they needed an interpreter, I wouldn't have any resources for them. And that that's a definite lack. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, it's important. Thank you, Ariana. And there there is a demand for because the first who is a, uh, he used to GM for years in RPGA when it was around and now for Pathfinder Society and he is certified in ASL and he has GM'd for deaf groups but that's few and far between which is really sad. Definitely. My limited sign. <laughs> uh, now I'm going to kind of uh, swing us around to a related but slightly different direction. Um, so this is like a three-part question, so I'll go over it more than once if I need to. Um, I'd like to hear if there are specific accommodations you think should be standard at every convention. So this does go back to like the interpreter uh, comment, but let's start out by talking about specific accommodations you think should be standard for cons that have long lines, like to pick up your badge. Uh, do you think there, there's stuff that cons could do there to be better? And uh, Elsa, I saw you nodding, so if you want to go first. Um, I'm sorry, uh, was I, that to me because you're working up again? I'll, I'll make a... Uh, I'll, I'll out again. Go first. Sorry. Um, I got a shout-out again for, uh, for another con. Um, Gen Con has a special services desk, and I think that's really helpful for when there are long lines because people with wheelchairs or even people who may need a walking cane can't necessarily stand in line for long periods of time. I mean, even with a wheelchair, if you're in a line that's super long, navigating the other people in that line is really challenging. Um, and people tend to be kind of snarky about it. They're like, oh, you get to sit down in line or don't run over me, which is not really how you want to spend your time in line. So I really appreciate there being a special services desk. The line is shorter, um, and it helps you in and out without having to deal with disability side eye or just being too hard on your money. Um, although I, I want to hear from Beth about this as well, you did kind of obliquely address the idea of invisible disability. Yes, um, there are disabilities that people can't see, and so there are going to be people who don't have to use a walking cane or choose not to use a wheelchair, or their doctors won't prescribe them a wheelchair, which I think is really important to realize. You have to get a prescription for one. Um, 
And all of those things mean that there are people who either don't have the things that they might want or don't necessarily need them but still have a chronic pain condition or an illness that means that they can't stand in line. Um, and deafness and blindness also can fall underneath the invisible disabilities banner and I think that's important to recognize that somebody who's in line with you who doesn't respond to you, isn't being rude, you may not be able to hear you. Yeah, that's definitely a good, a good point. And I know uh, you specifically have spoken uh, in the past about, uh, you know, you mentioned the the side eye and the snark. And I know since you um, occasionally use a wheelchair, you've talked about getting questions and uh, responses about whenever you're not in it, and yeah. how basically people need to mind their own fucking business. I think, I think that's the summary. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, I've been at a con where I'll be in the wheelchair, and I mean, I've only been using it for a year, but it actually saves me a lot of time later. Um, if I use the wheelchair at a con, I actually don't have to take a week to recover from being on my feet for three days straight. Um, but I've had people talk to me, oh my god, what happened to you? Uh, this is just easier and better for me. Oh, well, you know, I've seen you up and out of your chair before. It's like, you're not helping. <laughs> yeah. Your commentary is not helpful, and I don't actually know who you are, so go away. <laughs> um, so, uh, Beth, do you have anything to add about accommodations you'd like to see for long lines at conventions? Not really. I mean, Elsa pretty much hit all the targets because an extra line does really help. And yes, a lot of people have issues with mobility and other things that aren't visible. A friend of mine was recovering from cancer. They took a big chunk out of her thigh. Um, so for a while there, she was having issues walking. And But if you just look to her, she looked perfectly normal. But to try and stand in line, yeah, it would have been difficult. Unfortunately, sometimes when I do see those special accommodation lines, there's also quite a bit of snark attached to it from other people, which obviously just ticks me off. I, I, I don't even understand. Well, to them, they're like, well, why are we getting the special treatment? And it's like, it's not... Uh. It has nothing to do with special treatment. Sometimes what's fair for you, what's fair in a sense, is not going to be essentially fair. Because what's fair for them is for them to take the shorter line and for me to stand in the fucking longer line because it's not going to hurt me at the end of the day as versus as it might just hurt them to stand in that line and maybe being like, okay, I'm in physical pain, but guess what? I can't do anything because there's a person behind me. It's not like I can sit on the floor and just be like... So if a person's an asshole, then fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> in in that vein, I, I think uh, hopefully we can talk a little bit um, later on about dealing with that, with, with snark and side eye. But for the moment, um, so we did accommodations for long lines. What are some things that you would like to see at the actual uh, gaming table? And Beth, I thought I might start with you uh, this time. In this case, there needs to be communication flowing two ways. Um, if you're talking, are you talking specifically at conventions or at private groups as well? For now, let's talk conventions. Okay, because there does need to be a certain amount of communication going both ways. Because as a GM at conventions, I'm not always informed about if people need special accommodations um, when they show up at my table, because I'm more than willing to work with anybody. But it helps if I know more than, you know, something in advance, like before they show up. And that's where a lot of cons tend to fall down when things of that, you know. And it's, it is complicated, I'll readily admit that, because not everybody who has an issue thinks to necessarily say, oh, I, you know, when I register for every single game, I need to point this out. But so then if they don't, then the con doesn't notify the GM, so the GM can be prepared. But by the same token, the con also has to make it clear for people if they need an accommodation to express that up front. I mean, that's, it seems like coordination when you get to the actual gaming table is the trickiest part. Um, because like I said, I can accommodate anything if I have opportunity to prep. If 
the person pre-registered for my event, but I don't know they needed that till they showed up. It's more awkward for everyone. So that's where, like I said, some communication all the way around would be a big help. Okay, that's that's definitely helpful. Um, as a fellow GM, I know I am I am guilty of this one. So I'm glad you put that up. Yeah. All right, I, I I know I have without meaning to. Yeah, yeah, it's never intentional, but it's that's no, you know, we can do better, I guess. How about you, Elsa? Well, yeah, so I do, I mentioned at the beginning that I do accessibility coordination for a couple of different cons, and the thing that I've been trying to find ways to manage is that exact problem. I've been trying to find ways to create a way for people who need, or signing up for games to communicate with me so I can talk to their GMs. And I think a lot of it is that we need to create a culture where people can self-select to say, hey, I'm low vision, I need help getting a low vision friendly character sheet, or I'm deaf and I need an interpreter at the table, or I have, uh, I had one person who did actually contact me from Metatopia and they were like, I can't be in a really cold room because of my pain condition. So when we're talking about how to make that happen, I think it's both cons needing to create a way for people to communicate with an accessibility coordinator who can do that dialoguing, but also creating a culture where it's okay to say you need something. Because I think that there's a lot of, um, I don't want to say anxiety, but I think I want to say that there's a certain amount of uh, unsureness around whether or not it's okay to say you need an accommodation at the table. So I think that, especially at cons, where everybody's kind of meeting for the first time, we need to create a way for that to be acceptable. Okay, so that's that's fascinating to me. And I want to talk about this a little bit more. Um, so, because I, I think whenever talking about the snarkiness in line is connected to the idea of people being afraid to ask for accommodations. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think something that might help, like someone like me, is if uh, if I could get an idea of what kind of accommodations there are. Like maybe there is something that would help that I don't even know that, or if I have a disability, maybe it's something I need but I don't know it's okay to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, would you mm -hmm. mind providing some examples of those? Sure. I mean, I also uh, think that this. Oh. <laughs> No, go ahead. I think these are the kind of things that we can put on con websites with an accessibility header. Yes. Like these are things that we can provide at a game table. And that could be anything from large print character sheets or large print dice to closed room. Because that's really what I need. If I'm going to play in a game at a con, I need to be in a room that doesn't have six other games going because I can't hear. Okay. Let's see here. Did you have something um, you wanted to add, Beth? Yeah, I was going to say, like, another thing that some people might need is either uh, the sheets or any printed materials printed out in larger format or make a magnifying glass accessible or something like that. Um, you know, even little things as, because lately I've been buying dice that are easier to read. I love my pretty dice. They're not always easy to read. Yeah, I have yeah, large... So I to have them not just from by the table. Yeah. Well, it's not even just sometimes the large... I mean, large print dice, yes, but also, too, sometimes, like, the color combinations make a difference, you know. Um, but so there, there's a variety of things. And, again, if you were to know someone who um, was fluent in ASL, you know, for people who are deaf, you know, that would be fantastic. Um, or taking into account things like, you know, private rooms. Um you know, all those kind of little details. And also, too, can you physically get to the space? Or are there things that would impede a wheelchair? That is excellent, because that's actually the segue into the next question. <laughs> 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 because, uh, because, yes, I've seen this with my friends. Um, and I know I've, I've been to conventions before where um, people were physically unable to go to specific events because they weren't accessible. Um, because of stairs or hallway width, um, occasionally door frame width, um, 
and stuff like that, or it's just that it's really far away. Like the fact that mm -hmm. Gen Con has events in multiple uh, places across a very large campus. Um, mm -hmm. So that can definitely, I know, be an issue. But I should let you two speak to that. Well, we had, there used to be a convention here on Long Island that was at the university, and so events were spread out all over. And if you were able-bodied, it was tough getting from one place to another. If you had any sort of accessibility issue, it was murder. Um, and, of course, this is a state-funded college university, so some people would argue, oh, but, you know, well, the college has to have accessibility stuff, you know, why, why are you having a problem? Well, you're having a problem because the convention organizers didn't think to put buffer space in between events. Um, literally, events ended back-to-back -back and on opposite ends of the campus with no buffer time, and even something simple like that would have made a huge difference. Because, first of all, for the able-bodied people, let alone the people who are trying to navigate that distance in a wheelchair or with a cane or whatever. You know, so little things like that, first of all, can just improve the general convention experience for everybody, as well as, you know, people with accessibility issues. I, I love that suggestion and definitely would love to see it, it implemented. What about you, Elsa? Um, I'm sort of piggybacking on what Beth just said. ADA compliant does not mean ADA accessible. Um, Compliance is basically the bare minimum that a building needs to have in order to pass ADA regulations. So you can be in a building where, yes, it has an elevator or it has a ramp, but that ramp may not actually be usable, or that elevator may actually be too difficult for someone to get onto with their wheelchair by themselves. Um, a campus can be accessible while still being completely impossible to navigate on your own. So. When we talk about ADA accessibility, we're, we're talking about 25-year-old legislation that hasn't been updated and that really does need an update to make things even more accessible and more fair to people. Um, so when you're looking at a building, uh, I talked to one convention recently where they're like, yeah, the building is ADA accessible and it's really exciting. And then they went and looked at the space again and they realized the ramp was for people to get up by themselves. I'm sorry, you broke up a little bit on that last bit. The, the ramp was not a not steep. It was too steep. You can't get up it by yourself uh. if you're in a wheelchair. So these are the kinds of things that able-bodied con organizers need to be really, really careful about and investigative in terms of seeing whether a space is actually accessible versus whether the space says it's accessible. Because everybody's going to say we're ADA compliant. Um, do you, and I, I know this is your job, so it's, it's fair to say this is my job, um, yeah. but do you have any suggestions for con organizers and what they can do to be more aware of this? This is my job. <laughs> um, That's totally fair. Hire Elsa. <laughs> <laughs> Someone. I mean, if you want to give me money to make your con more accessible, I really am not going to say no. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's really important to start embracing the notion of accessibility as a needed part of the con de development system. You have people running operations. You have people running security. You should have at least one person thinking about accessibility at your con. And I think really you should have more than one because most of us who are doing the accessibility work are disabled. And we may have things come up. We may have health issues that crop up. We might not be able to do this because of spoons getting eaten up by daily tasks. So I think it's really important to recognize that it's a valuable service that your con should be providing. All right. That, that is fantastic. Thank you. And yeah, that's totally fair. Anytime. Uh, it's a good point to make. Anytime you're asking someone of a specific population to help your convention get better, you should pay them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so let's then talk about, and I think we're, we'll probably go for about 15 more minutes if that's okay with everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
so I think we already know how you guys feel about accessibility uh, policies and that they should be on the website. <laughs> um, and not buried on the website, by the way, because occasionally they'll be there, but they're buried in the incendia, you know, yeah. someplace where they can be seen. Did you have something you wanted to add, Elsa? Well, I'm not just buried, but I also think um, your accessibility policy needs to be comprehensive. It can't just be a one line on the website that says, we, we support people with disabilities and coming to our club. <laughs> that's not actually an accessibility policy. That's just you acting like that's what passes for us. Um, that's you saying that I'm inviting you, but I'm not letting you know if you can get through the front door. So. <laughs> An accessibility policy is a comprehensive guide to how you intend to support people with disabilities coming to your convention. It includes information about the space, it includes information about the hotel, there is one, it includes information about whether or not you have ESL interpreters, it includes information about whether or not you allow service animals, which, by the way, you should allow service animals, and if you don't, then that's a problem. Uh, <laughs> I mean... That's always the issue, right? Now, now you start having different groups' rights start to rub up against each other. Um, so, for example, I'm allergic to dogs. Right. However, that's why I, I don't normally cuddle with dogs, and I take my uh, allergy medication. But um, I don't know. I mean, I, I know, like, I personally would rather take my medication and stay away from an animal, which I know you should stay away from a working animal anyway. Right. If you're cuddling a service dog, you're breaking <laughs> <it>. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but since we're friends, like, so, so what about me and you? What if you had to bring a, a service dog with you? If I needed to bring a service dog, like, I would, if I knew that I was going to be on a panel with you, I would potentially set it up so that, like, the service dog could be elsewhere during our panel. Hmm. And maybe that's when my service dog takes a break. If somebody I'm on a panel with is really allergic to dogs, I would find a way to accommodate that issue. Um, if, if someone has a seizure dog, that's not going to be possible. The seizure dog is there to tell them whether or not they're about to have a seizure. Right. And I, I think in that case, I could deal with an hour worth of sniffling. Right. Yeah, like this, I don't think your allergies would be that severe. Like, I think if you have a, a point that you're just like, you're going to break in hives and your throat's going to close up, which is typically allergies of consuming something, so I hope you're not trying to bite on the dog. <laughs> um, you like, the thing is, if it's, dog? <laughs> but, like, you know, at the least, like, you would let the, be, if that was a severe allergy, you'd be like, hey, guys, just to let you know, I'm severely allergic to dogs. And you would let them know, but I, I think you, I think is if someone on a panel would be like, oh, I'm allergic to dogs, I'd be like, take the fucking pill and get on the panel. <laughs> like, no, I, I, I gave the dog at a geek con two, three years ago now, that was about disabilities and geekdom, and um, there was a woman with a service dog at the panel. And somebody was sitting right in front of them, bitching about how service animals smell and how they're allergic to dogs. This dog was literally sleeping right behind her the entire time. And I was like, um, uh, you're just being a jerk. <laughs> like, this dog was doing nothing if he wasn't having an allergic reaction. She didn't even know the dog was there until she stood up and turned around. <laughs> so... I, I, I think, yeah. Prioritize. I don't want to prioritize um, the dog over somebody who has a legitimate allergy, but I do want people to be aware and communicate with each other about what their needs are. Yeah, I think I think the that's kind of the point here, right? Like we can actually negotiate this and talk about it and be civilized human beings. Um, although in real life, I know Ariana would probably just throw a dog on me, which yeah. is a whole nother issue. But, I mean, my thing would be, like, you'll get over the allergy once you just rub your face on my dog's uh, fur. That's fine. But what? I think that's not how it works. <laughs> Whatever, science. <laughs> um, 
problems. I think it's more is just acknowledging that the service animals are working during that time. Like that yes. service animal is not going to jump on you. The service animal is no way in form a threat to you or a harm to you unless you have a severe allergy that you're very concerned about once you see exactly. the animal. But they are working. They're not going to get close to you. Their job is to make sure that the person that they are helping out is protected and safe and they manage to get through their day. And that dog isn't going to bark in the middle of a session. Like nope. Elsa put the example, that dog's probably going to sleep until there's signal to start working again. <laughs> and like I said, the dog will bark if, let's say it's an epilepsy dog, and that dog goes, you're about to have a seizure. We need to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I totally respect that. Um, but yeah, I wanted to bring up the fact that we can, we can actually talk about this and it's okay. Like, because I, I think that's also, that ties into the idea that people don't know what to ask for, and we feel like it's not okay to talk about these things. But now everyone can just tease me about dog allergies, and I can, <laughs> that's okay. I can also just look at, like, uh, Elsa's dog online and appreciate him from afar, because he's adorable. <laughs> she is. She. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, so... You were saying that there should be a comprehensive accessibility policy and that they should be broadcast. I know you brought up NorwestCon had handouts. Yes. They had, I wasn't there, but I heard about it from other people, and apparently I'm getting mailed a copy of their accessibility guidelines. It makes me really happy. Um, but, like, they had a handout that had all of the information about how to contact people if you needed assistance, if you needed assistance an interpreter, how to get in touch with them, like, it had all the information right there in front of you. Fantastic. So that's, that's a big one I think we hadn't talked about before, is the idea of having someone to contact. Uh, um, because that seems like, well, yes. <laughs> but that goes back to the idea of, of having a coordinator. So if you have a policy on, on accessibility, there needs to be someone a point person for you to talk to in case you need need something, right? Right. So, so my job at uh, the Double Exposure Con and also at Big Bad Con is that I'm the accessibility coordinator. So I I'm literally the one who says these are the things that we do and this is what we can help you with. And I also have an email address where people can email me before the con to say these are the things that I need. Um, I'm also on site or at least on the phone. So if you have an immediate accessibility issue, the people running operations call me because there might be an issue. There might be somebody who didn't know there was an accessibility coordinator and they have, say, a PTSD trigger that gets thrown at them during a game and they need somebody to talk to. That's my job. Or I find them somebody who they can talk to. So an accessibility coordinator is somebody who knows all of the right people to make an accommodation happen and they know what those accommodations look like in terms of both the legal term and what actually works within the space. Well, I think you just touched on something that's really important. So there's the idea of having conventions needing someone to be their coordinator and to help them figure out both how to set all this stuff up, but it sounds like the staff also needs to be trained on how when they should get you or any kind of coordinator, what they should do in a, in a situation like that. Yeah, I mean, it's the staff needs to know when you need to reach out to the accessibility coordinator. Because somebody who, say, is autistic and is having a bad reaction to something that happened, whether they get overstimulated or some other reaction, that's a different issue than a security issue. Security know what the difference looks like, for example. Oh, that's that seems that seems like a situation that's begging for terrible things to happen. Mm-hmm. All right. Why we need accessibility people because accessibility people take care of the people who need help and who aren't asking to be thrown out of the con, for example. So so training for staff, I don't know. It seems like it would be hard to figure out, like, 
training staff actually is not difficult just because I've had to train my staff to learn how to do certain stuff. Um, if Please. you want, I yes. can put the example like deaf and hard of hearing. We we deal with uh, blind people. We deal with people that happen to be bilingual or need. Uh, like Elsa and Beth had said, is once they're on the phone, they need to be very clear of this. This is what I need. So then we, for example, we say, well, that means instead of an hour, your session is going to be two hours because um, that way we make sure that when the interpreter is there, everything is set and clear. And we also make sure that the interpreters are knowledgeable of what they're talking about. So if, say, we have repeated cases where we're working with um, death and hard and hearing, then we say, all right, so I would like the so-and-so interpreter that's worked with us before. Because there are certain words in ASL which are the same meaning, so it'd be like, Hey, you need to pay this, and they when we said, oh, you have debt, so they can confuse that in being like, oh, they have money in a bank, and you're like, no, 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 you owe this person <laughs> so and so amount. So you want to make sure that that uh, person, when they come in, they know exactly what they're doing. Um, it's also just when you train your staff is basic, basic understanding of, hey, don't stare at the interpreter, stare at the uh, like, look at the person that you happen to be talking to and the interpreter will be your voice during the uh, during the meantime. Uh, don't get like annoyed if that person asks uh, several questions because if they're looking at the paper in front of them, that's a completely different language to them. So it's it's pretty easy to pick up. It's just making sure that all your staff is there and most of the time you're going to get a person that represents that community to come in. So when we trained my counselors, we had a person who grew up in a deaf family. Like, Michael yep. only has one hearing daughter and one hearing brother, so to them, this is normal. Like, they don't consider their disability a disability, so they explain to you how the community works, why are they, why would they react so-and-so, and how you should be patient in the meantime, because, again, it's like any other community. It's like, there's a community of gamers. We we have certain things that we're just like, this is our slang. And then you go to other communities, and they're going to throw a bunch of acronyms at you, and you're going to be like, what the fuck does that mean? And you're like, like, I'm sure Elsa can throw, and Beth can throw, like, a bunch of acronyms to us, and we'd be like, huh? And they'd be like, oh, it means this. So it's just sitting down, having a conversation, and realizing it's, Almost like they have their own culture and just being respectful of that culture. Uh, Elsa and Beth, do you have anything to add to that? And and thank you, Ariana, because now I feel less intimidated by the thought of such training. <laughs> I was just going to say that the thing about looking at the deaf person and not their interpreter is super important, and people at Kong should be doing that. If you run into a deaf person and they have an interpreter, you should be looking at the deaf person, uh, the one you're talking to, because that's the person you're having the conversation with. An interpreter is basically just a mouthpiece. And How about you, Beth? Oh, that. Well, I would also be... Yes, Beth, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um... I'm having sometimes, again, a bit of a lag, so I'm not quite sure when people are done talking. Um, well, in addition to look at the deaf person and not the interpreter, also, too, if you're dealing with somebody in a wheelchair, deal with the person in the wheelchair, not the person who's pushing them. <laughs> <laughs> and don't shout at me. No, because, again, with my team, this happened so many times. You know, they act like the person in the wheelchair isn't there or isn't competent, and instead they talk to the person who is holding things for them or pushing them or whatever. And it's like, no, no, they are a person in the in the wheelchair. They're the person you have to deal with, unless specific circumstances tell you otherwise. Yeah, I get a lot of people shouting at me when I have my pain, and I really, as a as a person who has uh, deafness in one ear, I really don't like to shout at at because I'm wearing hearing aids. Um, the raised voices are really not pleasant for me. Um, and apparently, being blind means you need to talk really loud. <laughs> I understand you. 
<laughs> their their idea is you can't see their facial expression, so to them it's like <laughs> maybe you'll understand me. Like no, no, the the I you no. <laughs> um, so in just a minute, I'm going to ask you guys to uh, promote anything that you're currently working on. But before I do that, uh, Elsa and Beth, do you have any last thoughts on the topic that you'd like to share? Um. Well, one of the questions that we didn't get to was about how to approach people. Yeah. And, and like, if you want to help them. And, again, my bottom line to that is just be courteous, just be polite, don't be patronizing, don't make assumptions. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I like that. I guess my sort of last thing is if you're working at a con or if you're at attending a con and you see somebody with a disability, um, especially if they're using a wheelchair, uh, approach people from the front. Don't approach them from the side or from the back. And don't make assumptions that they're going to recognize you from a panel. It happens to me a lot. People get really upset that I don't remember them and I can't more than three feet ahead of me. So unless if you came up to me after the panel and we had a meaningful conversation, I don't know who you are. Um, so just be really thoughtful about how you approach people with disabilities. Don't do something that assumes that they can see you or see you or know where they are. That is excellent. Um, now we are going to go ahead and put up all the many places that people can find your work. Um, Elsa, is there anything in particular you're working on right now you'd like to talk about real quick? Um, well, I just, uh, on topic, um, if you go over to Chuck Wendig's blog, terribleminds.com, I wrote a piece called So You Want to Write a Blind Character, which is all about blindness and how it uh, can, rep can be represented. It goes over such things as how blindness isn't all just not seeing things. Um, <laughs> common misconception, only 2% of the entire blind population is completely blind. Um, and I'm also the lead writer and developer on the Fade Accessibility Toolkit, which will be coming out from Evil Hat sometime in the next year. And, yeah, I'm interested in seeing how that turned out. And yeah. Beth, is there anything? Oh, sorry. What was that, Elsa? It's awesome. <laughs> They've got a really great group of people to work on it, and I'm really proud of the work that they've done. So that is that is how I feel. Awesome. And Beth, is there anything you'd like to draw attention to? Um, a lot of my work is in progress. Um, I am developing a RPG called Awesome Eights, and you can it has websites, but the websites aren't ready yet. Uh, but you can find it on Twitter as at um, as Awesome Eights RPG, um, and number that's the number eight. Um, I'm hoping for that to be out in 2017, depending upon lots of factors. Um, just not quite sure which quarter of 2017. So, but that's that's currently in progress. It's not handy right now, unless you're going to DexCon in July, in which case then you can try it. You can play there. Ooh, <laughs> ooh, that's exciting. Uh, Ariana, mm -hmm. any last thoughts? Uh, no, I thought it was a great panel. Thank you for allowing me to talk. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you sound so sad and put upon. <laughs> I'm not put upon at all. I mean, if that's the way you want to interpret it, so let's go for it. <laughs> we, we can talk about it later. Um, <laughs> But we are at the end of the time. Uh, Elsa and Beth, thank you so much for participating. Um, this, I mean, Ariana's right. This was a pretty great panel. Um, and thank you to everyone who watched or is watching after the fact. If you like this, please watch the other great content on Indie Plus and our programming on Diversity Plus. You can find this on the Indie Playlist, which is linked in the notes below. And you can also subscribe to Indie Plus by clicking the button. So all this goodness will show up for you as we post it. You can also join our G Plus community where there's a lot of exciting talk and more uh, events that are all centered around tabletop RPGs. Uh, thanks again, and say goodbye to the internet, everyone. Bye, internet. <laughs> Bye. Bye.